so again, um, thank you so much, Susan, and thank you, Gary, for this opportunity to um, share with you today and to engage in a broader discussion. I um, wanted in uh, framing this talk uh, to frame it in terms of three different perspectives uh, in which I've encountered uh, issues of racism uh, that have influenced uh, my life and the work that I do. Though I really don't want it to be about me, um, I feel a little uncomfortable on the personal aspect of this, uh, but at the same point in time, I, I thought uh, this would be an interesting uh, challenge. So I'm going to start off telling you a little bit about uh, racism from the perspective of an African American man, and then talk to you a little bit about uh, the scholarship uh, that I've done uh, as a psychologist studying the effects of race in the lives of African Americans and then in my role as Chief Diversity Officer. So let me start off with uh, telling you about uh, racism uh, from my perspective as an African American man. And when I think about race and racism, some of my earliest understandings of race and racism really come from my family through uh, what uh, we've uh, referred to in the literature as uh, racial socialization processes. And uh, my family and much of, uh, of who I am is based in large part uh, on my family. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, my uh, father was a Presbyterian minister and my mother was a nurse community activist uh, later running her own uh, uh, health center, a founding and running her own community uh, health center. And my father grew up in Wilcox County, Alabama. Uh, we were, by most accounts, uh, middle class. Uh, my father and my mother were the first uh, folks in their family to go to, to college. Uh, we have, as most uh, African-American uh, middle class and even upper class uh, African-Americans uh, have, uh, we were uh, one step away from object poverty. Uh, but my father grew up in Wilcox County in a, outside of a town called Camden. The next uh, county over is Dallas County, where Selma is. And uh, when he grew up, uh, there was a sheriff there by the name of Lummy Jenkins. And I grew up on a number of Lummy Jenkins stories. Now, the story that I'm going to share today is one that uh, my father would tell, and then uh, other members of my family uh, who grew up in the, um, the same county would talk about Lummy Jenkins in uh, similar kinds of ways in terms of him being a, a legend. So Lummy Jenkins, in many ways, is a real man. So after all these years, uh, I uh, uh, Googled him and looked him up. And in fact, he's a, a real person uh, who literally wrote a book about himself, uh, The Sheriff Without a Gun. Uh, but uh, my, as I mentioned, my father grew up in Wilcox County, and, the, and Wilcox County was a dry county, which meant that you couldn't drink alcohol. Uh, and so on Saturdays, uh, folks would go up to Dallas County, to Selma, to uh, go and uh, party. And there was one road, uh, one main road in and out of the county, uh, the county road. And on Saturday, on Friday and Saturday nights, uh, Lummy Jenkins and some of the uh, white citizens uh, would hang out on the road and pull over blacks and uh, beat them up as part of their fun. And my father uh, uh, tells a story of how he was uh, uh, 19 years old and was headed up to Dallas County, was um, on a date and uh, Lummy Jenkins had uh, pulled him over. And uh, my father tells a story and says, you know, this was a, a, a night when he very easily could have died because 
here he was, this uh, 19-year-old kid, uh, on a date, uh, uh, headed uh, out of town and is being pulled over uh, by the sheriff and by a, a, a bunch of uh, uh, white citizens whose only goal was to harass, humiliate, and uh, beat him. And as a 19-year-old on a date, he wasn't going to take it that night. He wasn't going to uh, uh, have this humiliation in front of uh, uh, the woman he was courting, as he would say, courting at the time. And so when the uh, folks came to pull him out of the car, uh, my father had his fist drawn and ready to, to, to swing and um, push back when they tried to, to grab him. And it was just about to jump off when Lummy Jenkins looked and noticed who he was. And he said, oh, wait a second, wait a second. Y'all need to leave that boy alone. He's one of them seller's boys. They all kind of crazy, just leave him alone. And uh, told him, boy, you just go on, on, on your way. And my father would tell the story and he would uh, always sort of at the end uh, make a little joke. He, said, he would say, you know, I was really happy that I was one of Lummy Jenkins niggas that night. And that joke uh, and that story and the way in which he told it uh, always touched my heart in a way that raised anger and fear and concern and all kinds of feelings about what race means, what safety means as a black male, what safety means as a black person in a country where uh, things can happen to you just because of your race. And so that was my first understanding of what it meant to be a black uh, male and what racism could potentially do to you uh, no matter who you were and what you were doing. A second story that I want to talk to you about with regards to race and how it relates to me as a uh, African American male is one that I um, wanted to pull out uh, specifically uh, given the audience that I'm speaking to today. And this uh, relates to a childhood experience that I had uh, with racism uh, in the medical setting. So as I mentioned, uh, my mother was uh, an extraordinary woman who uh, was a, a nurse, uh, a genius, uh, 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 who grew up in Cincinnati, grew up in the West End of Cincinnati, which is uh, where the most of the African Americans lived at that time uh, in the late uh, 1900s into the 1950s. Um, and when she came back, when she and my mother moved back, one of the things that she did was she founded a health center in that community because there would not been um, uh, much health care uh, in that uh, part of town. And uh, as a director of the health center, uh, as a kid, uh, whenever I had a cold or had uh, uh, any kind of medical issues, uh, I would go with my mother down to the uh, health center and uh, the doctors would take a look and the nurses would uh, take a look. And that's how I got uh, much of my um, uh, health care early on. Well, when I was a junior in high school, uh, I had um, suffered a cracked uh, uh, bone in my um, wrist. And I never really understood what the problem was because it would never really bend. And finally, after enough pain, I told my mother about it. And so she took me down to the uh, clinic. And so I'm down in the clinic and they take a look and they think it's um, uh, that my wrist may actually be uh, broken. I can't remember how I did it. I just knew that it, it uh, bothered me for a while. And at the time, uh, I was a uh, promising uh, high school football player. And so uh, because the, the clinic didn't have the um, imaging and the, uh, well, actually the x-ray facilities to uh, uh, truly diagnose the, the injury, they sent me up to the University of Cincinnati uh, Medical Center with a referral. 
and it happened to be a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, and so my mother uh, uh, took me up to the, the center and I waited in the um, uh, waiting room and uh, didn't really notice, but there were a lot of other uh, folks waiting. And uh, um, when we came in, the uh, receptionist uh, was not particularly warm, didn't have the same warm reception that I normally would get when I'd go uh, to my mother's clinic. Um, but I figured there was a lot of people waiting, so it just was one of those days. So finally, I get back uh, to see the doctor. Uh, my mother uh, uh, had to uh, run back for a quick meeting, and she was going to come back and pick me up. And the doctor uh, treated me in a way with disrespect that I had uh, not ever truly experienced. Uh, when I told him about my wrist and uh, I told him that I was a, a football player, uh, he looked at me and said, you know, that's part of the problem. Uh, you know, football won't take you but so far. Uh, I think you have a, a broken wrist. You really need to consider uh, other areas of life, but sports is uh, in some ways a dead end. <coughs> now, he didn't know that I was a straight A student at that time. He didn't ask. Uh, he didn't uh, uh, ask anything really about me other than uh, to give me this advice, uh, unsolicited advice about how I needed to really focus on, um, on academics and other aspects of my life as opposed to just putting all my eggs in the uh, football basket. So I come back, I tell my mom um, uh, what happened. My mom is upset. She goes and has a conversation. We come to find out that on Wednesdays, and because I was coming from the uh, Weston uh, uh, Clinic, Wednesdays was the day in which they took referrals from uh, the poor inner city clinics and they had automatically assumed that I either had no insurance, that I was coming from that community, and therefore it was okay to treat me in a way with such disrespect. When I came back from my follow-up after my mom uh, um, uh, raising hell, uh, it was amazing how nice uh, folks actually were and how concerned that uh, physician was about my overall well-being and how many questions he actually asked me with regards to uh, my medical care as opposed to making assumptions. So this is just one other example as an African-American male of what uh, life is like uh, experiencing uh, racism. And then the third piece is one that I'm going to uh, go through very quickly. And this is the, the reason why I avoid being around drunk white men. Throughout my life, I can count uh, probably 50 times when I have been either sitting alone or even worse with other friends uh, in a uh, restaurant or bar and uh, someone, and the person is always white, uh, feels a need to come over and comment about my size and comment about uh, uh, their fear, usually with a friend and says, oh, I think my friend could take you in a joking manner. And usually this uh, tends to happen more often uh, uh, when individuals are under the influence of liquid courage. I recognize the fact that I am not a normal sized person and uh, each day as COVID goes, I'm even less the normal sized person. But when I have talked to my other uh, uh, white friends and former teammates, none of them seem to have uh, had that experience. And somehow my mere presence um, uh, has um, provided a sense of um, privilege that uh, A, interrupting me or uh, engaging me uh, as if uh, my time was their time was appropriate, and B, somehow assuming that uh, 
my size made me intimidating to them. And in order to um, address their insecurities, it was okay for them uh, to quote unquote, joke around with me uh, about that. So I just wanted to start off this talk giving you some sense of the flavor of uh, one man's uh, perspective, one African-American man's perspective in terms of many of the racial encounters uh, that I've faced. Now I wanna jump to uh, the work that I've done with regards to racism and from the perspective of a race scholar. So I've been studying uh, racism uh, and the impact of race for a very long time. And when I uh, study race, uh, really it's from a framework of two forms of racism. One is the interpersonal uh, form of racism. And much of it you, you've seen uh, in the literature in terms of both conscious and unconscious uh, bias. So conscious uh, bias or conscious discrimination or um, conscious prejudice uh, are all about uh, processes that happen at a level of awareness uh, and often intentional in which individuals uh, treat other individuals of a different race uh, because of their race in inferior ways. Unconscious bias talks about uh, underlying schemas and other processes that leads to unconscious stereotyping and other kinds of behavior that's below the area of awareness. And much of the um, uh, work uh, around unconscious bias has uh, become uh, popular, popular in particular in terms of many of the trainings uh, that we uh, provide from a, a DEI perspective. And the assumption being that uh, people, because they're a part of this uh, society, which is a uh, society for which there's a significant racial hierarchy, uh, develop um, attitudes that are below their consciousness that impact the way in which they see and react to the world. The assumption is by making individuals aware of this unconscious bias that they uh, uh, may somehow be uh, less susceptible to actually engaging in it. Right now, if you look at the literature, the literature is still pretty um, equivocal with regards to whether or not that's true. The second form of, uh, of racism is one that you're beginning to hear more of. Systemic racism or uh, structural racism uh, really is about systems being racist, uh, uh, systems having disparate impacts on uh, individuals based on their race. Uh, it doesn't require uh, uh, any uh, particular attitudes. So some of the systemic racism is race-based and focused. So things like de jure um, uh, discrimination. Uh, so Jim Crow laws being a, a prime example where you have the full weight of a system or a structure with authority that uh, um, puts in place racially disparate uh, policies, practices, uh, and uh, cultures uh, in place. This form of uh, discrimination is often um, doesn't require the individual to recognize that uh, uh, racism is happening. Uh, and oftentimes there are arguments over whether or not the system is racist uh, or not. But if you look simply at uh, the outcomes, and uh, many would argue uh, much of the uh, medical uh, system uh, is an example of, uh, a, of systemic racism. And the most difficult and most um, pernicious isn't the race focused, but instead is the race blind. And these are the systems that are put in place that again, have a disproportionately negative racial impact uh, uh, and these systems are put in place in such a way that members of the um, uh, racially um, 
targeted group or the racially uh, marginalized group can actually be high up in those systems and uh, yet and still um, uh, be complicit in the negative racial uh, impacts. So for, for instance, uh, one of the things that keeps the systemic uh, race blind systemic racism in place is that there are oftentimes other uh, explanations that have been uh, developed to justify the systems continuing to be in place. In academia, for instance, we have a tendency to only, uh, as, as more elite institutions, to recruit uh, uh, students and um, um, faculty from other elite institutions. And we know that those institutions are elite and that they're good, uh, in part because we have a number of outcomes that are also tied tautologically to that initial assumption. And those systems also happen to be places where there are fewer and fewer members of traditionally underrepresented groups. So uh, we know that the University of Michigan is a lead institution. Why? Because we uh, admit students from other elite institutions. They go on and uh, end up getting jobs in other elite institutions. They then end up uh, getting grants uh, that are based in part on uh, pedigree that's based on a particular definition of um, what an elite institution is. We train postdocs off of those grants who again accrue some of that benefit with regards to the elite institution and the system continues to recapitulate itself. Um, uh, and even though there are disparities, the disparities, uh, racial disparities are written off, uh, not as a problem of the system, but somehow a problem of the individuals uh, who are uh, disparately impacted. So, as I mentioned, for 30 years, I've studied the role of race in the uh, psychological lives of African Americans. I've uh, attempted to do this uh, uh, with a view of African Americans as whole normative human beings. There's a whole literature that uh, looks at African Americans only as stimuli to understand the uh, racial attitudes of whites. Uh, there's another literature that views African Americans from a deficit perspective and looking at the impact of discrimination and the impact of uh, stigma and other uh, forms of racism uh, in such a way that they define African Americans as inherently damaged. That is an approach that I have uh, vehemently uh, denied and fought against. I've also attempted to do this from the perspective of African Americans. So looking at their lived experiences uh, as opposed to from the perspective of others or from quote unquote, a objective uh, perspective, which is also a perspective of others, which devalues the perspectives of the lived experiences of African Americans themselves, if one is not careful. My work is really focused in three areas. Uh, again, racial discrimination, and most of my work on uh, racism and racial discrimination has focused on interpersonal uh, experiences of discrimination, uh, while also looking at the distal impacts of racism writ large. I also look at racial socialization. In other words, the processes by which uh, families and uh, other institutions transmit messages about the meaning of race to African Americans. So in my case, the Lummi Jenkins um, story is an example of racial socialization processes. And then uh, probably I'm most noted for my work on racial identity, which uh, attempts to understand the uh, attitudes and beliefs that African Americans have with regards to both the significance of race in their lives, as well as the meaning. So what does it mean to be Black in their lives? And uh, for some folks, it may be surprising, but African Americans vary significantly on both of those questions. 
and the answers to those questions have real import and impact with regards to a number of uh, outcomes, including the impact of racial discrimination on their lives, uh, as well as direct impact on psychological, physical, and academic well-being outcomes. So just uh, to give you a quick update, uh, so what have I learned in 30 years of study uh, of race in African Americans? Uh, first, across a number of different studies, uh, looking at African American youth uh, from uh, as early as age seven all the way up to um, uh, uh, old old age. I guess that's where I'm at now. Old age, um, uh, but I'm going to focus, uh, given this audience, on our youth. Uh, that in general, African American youth report experiencing non-random levels of racial hassles in their lives. Not only are they non-random, uh, but they're actually uh, pretty high in terms of uh, the ubiquitousness of uh, their experiences of daily racial hassles in their lives. And we've done this looking at all kinds of different uh, approaches from interviews to longitudinal survey studies to daily diary studies. And we have a similar um, uh, set of findings across those approaches. We also find that across a number of different studies uh, and across a number of different ages, but again, I'll focus on African-American youth, that experiencing racial hassles is toxic to a variety of outcomes. Again, uh, psychological well-being outcomes, physical health outcomes, as well as academic outcomes. We consistently find that those individuals who report experiencing more hassles uh, report less positive outcomes. And they do so in uh, projective ways so that experiences uh, at time one impact outcomes at later times. And we've even uh, replicated these findings through experimental methods. It should also be noted that not only does experiencing racial hassles have a toxic impact on African-American youth, but we find that for youth in uh, middle school uh, up through high school, that their parents' experiences, daily experiences of racial hassles have an impact on the youth's outcome as well. And last but not least, it's also important to note that African-American youth, like other African-Americans, have sources of resilience that buffer the impact of experiencing racial hassles. So the types of racial socialization messages that uh, youth receive, the types of racial identity attitudes that they have do provide some buffer uh, against the negative impact of experiencing uh, racial hassles. Specifically, those youth who have an understanding that first, racism exists, that second, they have strong, positive uh, feelings about being African-American. And third, that being African-American is a central part of who they are, tend to be buffered against the negative impact of uh, experiencing racial hassles and racial discrimination. Now I want to uh, shift to uh, a quick discussion of racism from the perspective of a chief diversity officer. So as you can see, this is uh, what I lovingly refer to as our Wheel of Destiny. It is a representation of the University of Michigan's five-year diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan. I've been the chief diversity officer here at the university now for uh, going into my um, seventh year. And the DEI strategic plan uh, is in many ways the um, aspect of my job that I'm uh, most uh, proud of and hold the uh, greatest hope for in terms of uh, the, the change in the university. I've been at the University of Michigan now for 27 years uh, between being a graduate student and being a faculty member and now administrator. 
Uh, there are many things about the University of Michigan for which I'm very proud of, uh, particularly as it relates to issues of DEI. And then there are other things that I'm uh, less proud of. But I do believe that the DEI strategic plan is an opportunity to make a big difference here at the university as an opportunity to make diversity, equity, and inclusion a, a key component of who we are as an institution. The DEI strategic plan really has one simple objective, and that is fundamental, replicable, reinforcing institutional cultural change. And that cultural change being towards making the university a more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive community. That's it in a nutshell. That's the goal of the strategic plan. And we wanted to do this in such a way that it is the university's responsibility to make this change. And in a way that also says that we are all part of the university. And in doing so, the goal is to create both agency and ownership throughout the university. One way to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion and, and on our campus, and one way when I'm uh, down with regards to our progress, is when I think about our uh, broader goals. So when we started this uh, process, the notion of diversity, equity, and inclusion was really a uh, contested uh, perspective. Uh, I had been in many meetings and many spaces where I had to make the case that uh, we as a department or we as a university or we as an area really needed to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. That this should be a part of who we are and what we're doing. And others had argued whether or not um, diversity really is part of our uh, values, whether it's in conflict with other parts of our values and going back and forth with an, uh, battling an inertia to actually do something. One thing that I am proud of is that we are no longer in that space. Regardless the, of uh, uh, our argument, it's no longer whether we as an institution should be uh, engaged in diversity, equity, and inclusion activities. We have really important and heated uh, uh, ideas about what we're doing and how we're doing it and whether we're doing it well enough. But really, pretty much as an institution, we've made that commitment to making diversity, equity, and inclusion a core institutional value. So you don't have to have the argument over whether or not we should or not. From the highest levels of the institution, we have said that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a part of who we are and we should be doing something about it. And the DEI strategic plan being uh, one example of that. But the, having it as a core institutional value is not the stopping point by any stretch of the imagination. We still have a long, long way to go. And to be able to say what one's core value is, while important, and hopefully ultimately driving our thinking, our planning, our action, it isn't necessarily action in and of itself, and it doesn't necessarily uh, represent uh, where we are. It's really more of an end state that we hope to, to get to. So in my mind, having DEI as a core institutional value is really uh, important and is an important next step, but we're not where we ultimately want to be. And where we ultimately want to be is about behavior. When we act, we think, we do in ways that are consistent with a diverse, equitable, and inclusive community, that is when uh, we're at a place uh, where we can truly, fully celebrate um, the effort uh, that we're, we're under. When everything that we do, we think in the context of, well, how is that related to diversity? How is that related to all of our uh, community as opposed to our average community? 
uh, how are those policies, how are those practices all coming into place? Within the DEI plan, uh, we've attempted to address and change that culture through a number of different ways. Uh, and these different ways have different impacts at different levels. The reality is that, that uh, you don't change culture overnight. As my uh, mentor and the first chief diversity officer at the University of Michigan, Charles D. Moody uh, told me uh, when I first took the job is, Rob, remember that it took the University of Michigan 200 plus years to get like it is. It's not going to change overnight. But change it can. And so what we try to do is implement uh, tools such as raising institutional awareness, enhancing individual skills and capacities. So people aren't born with uh, the skills and capacities to interact across difference in productive ways, in uh, non-offensive ways. We have to actually teach folks to do that. We've uh, really increased our capacities around training, et cetera. Uh, this is a piece that's particularly important, aligning our policies, our procedures, our processes, and our programs in ways that are consistent with diversity, equity, and inclusion. So as we attempt to dismantle racism, particularly structural racism, looking at our policies, our procedures, our processes are extremely important tools to dismantling um, uh, racism. Because as I had mentioned before, those non-race focused um, uh, structures are often the ones that are the most problematic in terms of their, their racially disparate impact. Not only is it important to dismantle racism, but it's also important to create uh, a set of cultural norms that is to replace a negative culture with the culture that you ultimately uh, desire. That means to reinforce the behaviors that you value, to um, uh, make it clear that you punish those behaviors that are unacceptable. You create reinforcers so that the system that you want to put in place or the culture that you want to put in place ultimately recapitulates itself. And uh, last but not least, it's then important that we also broaden our institutional access. So we're attempting to do all five of these things at the same time. The level of their impact may differ from more proximal impact to more distal impact, but across each of these factors uh, is really our strategy for making uh, change. Last but not least, Again, I think it's important as we uh, think about our cultural change and from the perspective of chief diversity officer that we remember that cultural change is always difficult. It always takes time to achieve. It has to be linked to fundamental values of the organization. So we have to make sure that as we make this change, we're uh, aware of the underlying values that already exist within the organization and make sure that that change is consistent with those. We need to repetitively reinforce the change that we want uh, in order to sustain itself. In times like this, it's especially important for us to remember that change and that progress is never a linear function. That sometimes we'll take three steps forward and then have to take two steps back in reaction to the change that we're trying to make. Any system, its fundamental goal is to recapitulate itself. So as we attempt to tear down uh, uh, structures, particularly uh, 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 structural racism, uh, there always is a reaction to that uh, effort. And so we must recognize that sometimes we uh, move forward and then sometimes we uh, that progress leads to even greater resistance and we must continue to have that commitment to go through that resistance. And last but not least, 
it's also important to recognize that, com that cultural change requires commitment at all levels of the organization. It can't just simply be um, uh, something that is ordered on high. Uh, it can't just be a grassroots uh, movement. It has to happen at all levels of the organization. And oftentimes at the middle of the institution is a space where you see um, the, the greatest uh, difficulty in implementation. With that, I want to uh, shut up. I think I went on a little longer than I had hoped, but I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share. And I uh, look forward to uh, an opportunity for us to engage in some dialogue. Thank you so much, Dr. Sellers. Thank you so much for that unique perspective and such an insightful presentation. And indeed, you've left just the right amount of time for questions. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and uh, we'll be able to share those with uh, Dr. Sellers. And um, while you're getting your questions typed in, um, maybe I can kick off with one. Uh, you said it's not a lot, that these changes are not linear. Um, and I just wondered, how have the events of this summer with uh, the increased attention to racism and, and social injustice um, in light of the George Floyd uh, killing, um, how has, have these events changed um, the momentum um, for DEI efforts at the university and what have you seen emerge as a result of that? So it, that's a very good question. Um, the, one of the things that you see is uh, a great deal of attention uh, being played with regards to um, the need for anti-racist uh, uh, work. Um, and the university last week announced a number of uh, initiatives uh, that uh, we'll be undertaking that are focused on uh, anti-racism and with a particular focus on anti-black racism, um, uh, which I am very proud of and very uh, happy. Uh, you, you also see a number of demands playing out across the campus from uh, various uh, student groups uh, to address uh, the current uh, uh, context. And uh, you see uh, a re-engagement in terms of uh, a number of the administrative units in response uh, uh, to these demands. Uh, and I think all of that is great. And I think all of that energy is wonderful. And we really need to utilize that energy to um, reinvest in the work that uh, we're doing. On the other hand, I think it's also important to note one of the goals of the DEI was that uh, demands would not be the first place that individuals needed to go to make change. That it should be the institution's responsibility to make change. And when I looked out uh, across higher ed and saw a number of the initiatives that were um, um, proposed, and where a number of institutions were making uh, similar commitments to uh, anti-racism. One of the things that I was most um, proud of is that many of those initiatives that people have uh, made the case for are already going on on our campus. Um, whether it's cluster hires, uh, whether in terms of faculty, uh, whether it's commitments to re-examine um, um, uh, both the curricula and pedagogy. Uh, many of those were things that were already part of our strategic plan and were happening in different places on campus already. Uh, and so what I hope will happen is that we will continue to uh, leverage and be energized by the current movement, but that we will not start with a notion, start from a notion that we're starting from the beginning and not recognize a lot of hard work that's already been done by lots of people in lots of different places and spaces on campus and to look to utilize those uh, levers first as a way to push the university 
uh, forward and to do so from a perspective where it is your university uh, uh, as opposed to from a perspective where one is negotiating. Because if one's negotiating, then the goal of any negotiation is for each side to get the most with the least amount of effort. And at the end of the day, at the end of that negotiation, you are still not part of the same team or the, the same group. Uh, and I really uh, uh, want us to push a space that says this is our university and therefore these are the things that we must do as a university to make the changes that as a owner, a member, a part of this community, I want this university to look this way regardless of where I sit in the university space. Thank you so much. We have a question here that asks, what keeps you motivated to continue the fight when it feels like things are going backward before forward? Uh, for me, I, I, I uh, shared a piece this summer um, uh, that was just from the heart. For me, it all goes back to my parents. Uh, and it really goes back to my family story. And they're providing uh, a framework for understanding that change is uh, intergenerational. When I first started this position, uh, again, taking the advice of um, my uh, mentor, Dr. Moody, uh, I said something to the effect that uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint, that the work that we've got to do. And the reality is that's actually not true either. It's really a relay that we as a people, and from uh, my perspective, my cultural and, and historical perspective, we have been fighting uh, uh, since we were here in 1619 or even before um, uh, in this case to uh, on a journey to make this uh, uh, land um, uh, a place of um, that that is a place of justice, is a place of equity, et cetera. And so I see myself as one link in a larger chain. My responsibility uh, uh, is to honor all the work that those who came before me who've given me opportunities that my parents never had uh, and uh, who their grandparents never had. And so therefore looking at the future, um, uh, it's important uh, to focus on what are the opportunities for the next generation. And so when things feel like they're tough, uh, I look back on how things really were. And oftentimes they weren't, uh, they were much tougher then, uh, and yet people pushed uh, to move us forward, so. Excellent. So, um, Again, if you have questions, please do go ahead and put them in the chat. We will give those to Dr. Sellers. I just um, have one other question that's a little, it's sort of two parts because this is the Department of Pediatrics. And so um, a two part question, what advice would you give to us as pediatricians in our roles uh, interacting with youth um, around issues of race? And what advice would you give our department um, if we want to be amongst the leaders and best in DEI? So the, the first thing is to um, find and check your bias. Recognizing that every time you interact with uh, a um, patient, regardless of what they may look like or seem like, uh, you have an impact on their uh, life. And 